And so uh, thank you everyone for joining in our uh, live interview with Seth Kearsley, uh, producer of Moments Alive. Thank you for being here, Mr. Kearsley. It's it's a great honor indeed. Um, we're just people are still talking about this show, <laughs> you know, twenty some here, years I'm later. Okay, <clears throat> I'm here for a very rare occasion, and this is fun. All right. Um, let me just set us. Uh, let me just set up some ground rules before we start. Um, obviously, don't try to talk over to each other, like uh, on top of each other. Uh, when someone asks a question, please be respectful, stay silent, and uh, let Mr. Kearsley answer it. And then, uh, if we keep um, doing this, everything will run smoothly. Uh, so yeah, just keep those ground rules in mind, and uh, we should start. If you want to ask a question, feel free to do so in VC chat. Just say, "Hey, yeah, I want to ask a question," and we'll give you um, the ability to, you know, ask. Uh, and then after everybody has asked their questions in VC, we can move on to our special text channel with the, all the questions written down. Um, so uh, let's start. Who wants to ask the first question? All right. I don't know how different that is in other how I see it, but uh, technically for me, the first guy is uh, Chair or Leo. I should really change my uh, name, so. We could go there. Oh yeah, make sure not to include me because I'm I'm just here to record. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Let, That's fine. I'll let extra go first. Mm -hmm. Oh. Uh, all right. Extra is fair. So um, I actually would you like to answer to ask a question? Yeah, I actually have a question to ask. I yeah. remember when spicy. I remember when spicy first started talking about this show. Um, mm -hmm. I I I used to like um, my knowledge on mommy shows isn't really that great. So um, I remember watching like uh, like a show um, like a, an animated series based on the mommy movie. Um, mm. And I used to like when Spicy started talking about Mummy's Alive. I was like, isn't that like that that one show based on the mummy that I kind of remember? Uh, but apparently not. And uh, my question is, did you have something to do with that show by chance also? <laughs> no. 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 You had a question in here. Um, what what was the best episode they worked on? Um, and what episode was the most difficult to animate? No, I, I had nothing to do with the, the, um, that one. I, I And actually, I, I barely remember that there was um, that, that show. <laughs> um, did you watch that whole show? Or were you just aware of it? Um, no, I didn't watch the whole show. Sadly, I didn't. Really have <laughs> okay. Sorry. Would you like to? But I. But from what I've seen so far, I really liked it. No, I mean of of the mummy, the one that from the Universal, uh, um, from the movie. Did you watch that one? Was that? Oh. Um. I don't really remember much of that show, honestly. So yeah, but I, I know I know it exists. That one. Um. <laughs> well, um, now now you know of another mummy show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Should Mr. Seth uh, perhaps answer your question that you did type in questions for Seth? Um, what was the best episode? Uh, what was yeah, yeah. What was the best episode about? you worked on? Yeah, that's the uh, same question I had. I just had that. Um, I just had that, that passing passing question just just so. Yeah. Well, also, you guys have to remember that um, for me, this was um, like it, it aired in ninety seven, ninety eight. So I would have been working on it in like ninety six, ninety seven. Um, so um some of some episodes i totally remember like oh yeah that that episode was really good and then there are other episodes that i remember like oh my god that episode was really bad um, and then there are a bunch that when i see titles of names i'm like yeah i think there was an episode that was named that um so this was a long time ago for me um uh <clears throat> but um the best episode um i wrote an episode called um, my dad the hero um, which, um, you know, I tried to with the show, um, 
you know, Presley wasn't, um, you know, a blonde white kid with blue eyes, which is what, you know, like basically all main characters of cartoons were, um, you know, he was actually, you know, person of color um, because he was supposed to be descendant from a pharaoh. So it felt weird to have him not seem like he could be Egyptian. Um, and, um, and, you know, we had mom as, you know, a very, um, you know, hardworking, intelligent, um, uh, single mother. Um, and, you know, I, I really um, always disliked the animation orphan thing where just the other parent is never talked about. Um, and so for this episode, I really pushed for um, having the dad um, showing, having one episode with the dad um, and showing that dad is actually kind of um, an absentee father um, and that he just comes in um, once in a while to, um, you know, bring Presley a gift or something um, and act super cool. And, um, and then he's gone for all the hard stuff. And so I was happy that we were able to do that in that episode. Um, and then also um, there were a lot of things um, with the show that, um, you know, I was 23 when I was doing the show um and 23 24 25 somewhere in there um and uh so you know you don't get a lot of say um especially when um you know there are a bunch of uh, big companies that are involved and um uh so you know the the fact that the mummies all like had different vehicles um i was just like i mean they're like magical mummies like do they really need vehicles um uh, but, um, but, you know, it was a toy thing. Um, and, uh, so, you know, in that episode, I also, um, uh, got to poke fun at the catchphrase that they say. Um, and I got to have, uh, a mega version of Scarab destroy all of the vehicles. And it was like a, you know, just for me a little like, ah, that's good. Um, at least <laughs> I got that one in there. Um. Uh, and then the hardest episode, um, there was one that we did that um, it just like the technology was not there to actually pull off this episode. Um, but there was an episode with um, uh, a water uh, god, um, Nun, um, and um, we tried all of these different things to try to make the water look cool. And um, in the end, he just kind of looked like a goopy mess. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Very informal. Uh, thanks for asking that question. And yeah, um, I have to personally say that uh, my dad, the, my dad, the hero, definitely stands out uh, from the other from the other episodes in the series, both in terms of uh, comedy and action. I'll say that. Uh, and it's so nice that you got one one episode specifically with your personal spice put into it. Yeah, I mean, I wrote premises for um, a bunch of the episodes, um, but that was the only where I took it all the way through to script. Um, and, you know, I, I was really involved in the scripts, but, you know, we had story editors who, uh, you know, they had um, just before Mummies, they had story edited um, the X-Men animated X-Men series. Um, so uh, they they were really they were putting up with this kid who was, um, you know, the captain of the ship, or this particular ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> so we move to, on to the next question. Um, the next question line is uh, Jacob, or Jacob, I guess I could say. Uh, do you have a yeah. question that you'd like to ask yourself? I do have one. So, hello. I actually did the interview with you. Ah, hey. Hey. And so, yeah, going? I've been researching a lot of Chinese mythology. Uh -huh. One thing I found is these the Chinese had these jade burial suits, which are really cool. Oh, Do you nice. have any ideas yeah. for those? You know, um, uh, we talked about uh, what was going to happen in a second season. Um, and, you know, so just bringing everyone else up to speed, um, if, if anyone, I'm, I'm assuming no one knows. Um, but um, you know, we talk, talked about one of my plans for a, a second season was to include other cultures that also mummify. Um, and so having like a Chinese um, uh, storyline or series of episodes or um, you know, uh, something like that 
Um, so um, I, I didn't get into it too deeply um, to, to find that. That would have been really cool, and I would have found that. Um, uh, and it definitely would have been incorporated into armor. Um, uh, but um, as far as I got, you know, because these were all like ideas for a season that I already knew wasn't going to happen. Um, and, you know, I just thought like, I mean, I'm just going to like keep playing with these ideas and see. Um, but, you know, it was business decisions for why it wasn't going to happen. Um, so that it's, there's no amount of passion that I could have brought to it that would have made a, another season happen. Hmm. It would definitely be really nice to see an upcoming season two and for for you to reintroduce like a lot more culture. Um, but yeah, which would actually tie into my question. But uh, the next question in line is uh, comes from uh, Jacob over here. Jacob, would you like to ask? Well, first, it wasn't um, my original idea. Um, it mummies starts because um, Ivan Reitman, uh, Hasbro, and uh, Deke um, had done the real Ghostbusters uh, together, um, and those toys sold like like gangbusters. Um, and uh, so they had always planned on, uh, or maybe not always, but you know, at, at a point they were like, you know what, we should try to do that again. Um, and so that's that's where the show comes from. Um, uh, and the the head of Deke uh, was like, I mean, kids are into mummies, um, so let's let's do something with that. Um, and you know, it's more how like a, a studio show happens, like through producers. Um, is then they, um, you know, kicked it into development and development hired writers, um, uh, which uh, I don't know if um, the Leewalds who, you know, were coming from X-Men, um, you know, at what point they came into the um, project, um, but they would have um, started to build up all of the mythology around the characters and things like that. And so um, I was being brought in uh, to direct the show. Um, and uh you know kind of be the the showrunner uh, i was the producer director um and uh you know really i was so young that when um i had the interview and they spelled out how uh horrific the schedule was going to be i didn't even know to know that that was a horrific schedule at the time um i just thought you know there's no way they're going to hire me i'm too young i've never directed before and they're going to give me a whole series um and so when they asked if i could do it i was just like yeah totally um and uh they called my bluff <laughs> sorry um so um so i come into it after um you know there had been a lot of development done there was a lot of art that was done and then i was able to kind of um put my spin on it um and you know the mummies um originally um would have just been like just mummies um, you know, they, they weren't going to have uh, armor and stuff. I think that they were going to have like a, a superhero form of themselves. Um, but um, the movie uh, Stargate had, uh, you know, recently come out. If you guys are at all familiar with that movie. Um, uh, oh, and I just thought, just like, you just know the name? Yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard the name. I haven't watched the movie, unfortunately. Ah. Uh, um, so Stargate was like um, like a sci-fi Egyptian um, thing, and so it was sort of like you know putting forward the idea that you know a aliens built the pyramids and stuff like that. Um, uh, but they had really cool high-tech um, armor and weapons and stuff like that, and so we were really borrowing um, a lot from that movie, um, especially for uh, Jakal's um, headdress. Um, if you, <coughs> sorry. If you look up uh, Stargate, you'll see um, some of the, the guys that they just have that falcon head. And it's just so cool. Um, so, you know, I was able to kind of like steer it that way. Um, and then um, when premises started to come in for the show, um, then I could kind of 
um, you know, uh, it's not like I had free reign, but I could kind of choose what premises we were going to do and what we weren't and give notes on on it to kind of, you know, give it a, a direction, um, you know, along with the, the Leewalds. Uh, and then at a point, um, I started writing premises to really like, um, to really push it even further in, in a direction that I wanted to go. Um, and some of the premises were for big reasons, like um, uh, my dad, the hero, uh, and some of the premises were um, for production reasons, like, um, okay, we can't keep going to new locations, our background department is dying. Um, uh, so let's do one where they shrink and we stay inside the Sphinx so that we don't have to, um, you know, do a design a whole new location, um, uh, stuff like that. Um, or there was an episode where, um, you know, there was this shriek mode that, that the characters did, uh, and, um, you know, we kind of had to put it in, um, a bunch of different episodes. Um, and so, you know, I was like, what if we had one where we just did that shriek mode like 30 times in the episode? And so uh, I tried to come up with a premise for how they lose their powers and the only thing that they have to defend themselves with is that shriek mode. Um, and so we literally did it probably 30 times an episode and then we never had to do it again. Uh, they're like, yeah, that's good. We don't need to do it anymore. Uh, so. uh, fun enough, I'm going to insert a little uh, side note here. That is actually my favorite episode of the original series. Um, uh, Dark Dark Night. Night. Yes, yeah, yeah. Indeed, that is my uh, something about it just sticks out both in terms of tone and it's just nice seeing the mummies in a more recognizable environment just like having them be more humans than protectors in general it's yeah, yeah. really original yeah yeah i like the uh, the song that um nefertina sings in that one um which um uh Cree summers was the voice of nefertina um and i found out that she um she was a singer and so we're like, oh, we should ever sing at some point. And so then, um, you know, we threw that one in. And uh, I remember pitching it to um, our executive from Northern Lights, uh, which was Ivan Reitman's company. Um, and uh, I knew that he was into jazz. Um, and so, you know, I, I thought, like, we could do it kind of like as a spoken word jazz kind of a thing. Um, and I actually played him a song from um, So I Married an Axe Murderer. Um, to uh, um, convince him that it could be fun and funny. Mm -hmm. That song is actually really good in the original series. I really liked it. Um... Well, um, pilots are usually, um, it's like a proof of concept of a show. Um, and usually there's already some funding in place because, uh, you know, a pilot can be like, you know, if it's a full pilot, it can be like 200 and like 200,000 to 500,000, like back then, um, uh, you know, plus all the development that goes into uh, to it. So usually, and when there's a pilot for animation, it's different for live action. But for animation, if you're if you're actually at full pilot, um, then you you probably have some funding already um, with mummies because it was um, Ivan Reitman's company and Deke and Hasbro all coming together to do another show. Um, there wasn't a pilot. They just decided that they wanted to do a show. Um, you know, the, the reality, I, I don't know, I guess it's different now, but the reality of, you know, boys action, um, shows in the nineties is that they were, you know, commercials for the toys. Um, so, uh, that's what this show was. It was decided beforehand that, you know, there was going to be toys. Um, and, uh, 
Um, and that's why, you know, the toy company was in on the design of the characters and the vehicles and all of that stuff. And so, um, and sorry, I totally forgot the, the rest of your question, um, but uh, did I answer it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, um, it's it's not really though. Um, you know, like you might have a pilot uh, animatic, um, uh, but to take something to fully finished production quality, um, uh, you know, you, you're definitely not doing it to go out and find funding. You you've got some funding if you're doing that because um, uh, it's so expensive. Um, usually, um, it's uh, you know, presentation boards and pitches and, and things like that to, to get people on board. Um, and uh, it's different now, um, you know, that with technology, it's so much uh, faster, cheaper, easier to like make something move um, and to get something, um, you know, a little closer to a finished product. Um, but, um, you know, uh, a bunch of years after Mummies, uh, I did a pilot for uh, Kingdom Hearts um, series, um, and yeah, and even that wasn't a full pilot. It was a seven-minute um, animatic. Um, it was a, um, a like a a pitch piece, um, and so you know it was rough storyboards um, uh, that we colored in Photoshop and then edited um, with sound effects and and dialogue um, to sort of give an idea of the show. Um, and that's more where a studio would take, you know, a, a project like that. Um, but, you know, if you're pitching on your own, you're most likely pitching, you know, um, just individual art, especially, you know, in the 90s. Um, mm -hmm. Very interesting stuff, indeed. Uh, sure. So we move on to uh, Leo. Leo, do you have a question for Sorry, my. Uh... Oh, you 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 kind of cut out a. Yeah, it sounded that? like he was about to say my mic isn't working very well. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, I have two questions. They're both about the industry. So, what's okay. it like working as an animator for a cartoon, or producer, whatever position you had? And what's the second one? Because maybe I can work both into yeah, into one. Into one. Like how how was it like working on Mummies Alive? Ah, okay. Um, what's it like working on the show? Um, you know, there's a there's a phrase that you you start to hear um a lot um that uh, you know, this is how the sausage gets made. Um, because you know you sort of come in thinking it's going to be one thing, and then you realize it's it's something else. Um. Just like, you know, you think like, well, I'm I'm going to run the show so I can do whatever I want. And then, you know, the reality is that, you know, you, even though you might be the top of the ladder for the show, you definitely still have bosses and they definitely still have opinions on what's going to happen. And um, so, um, you know, when I first came into animation, um, uh, you know, and you're working as like a layout artist um, or a storyboard artist, um, you know, you feel a little bit more creatively um, free um, uh, because as you're sitting there doing the work, it's just you doing the work. And so you can kind of do whatever, um, but you know, then you have notes that come in and, uh, and like that. Um, and as you go up, um, then you have, um, in some ways, you have more creative freedom, um, and in other ways, you have less. Um, uh, you know, you have more because then you're the person that's giving the notes to um, the the people below you. But um, but then, you know, as you go higher, um, the amount of people that are above you it gets more concentrated, and so you ultimately you get to someone who has like veto power over everything, and so. It's not ever like you can do whatever you want. Um, at, you know, even on a show where it's like someone created the show, um, there's still, um, you know, when you create a show and you sell it to a studio, you sell it to the studio. Like it's their show now, um, and you work on it. Um, so, 
it can be a lot of fun, um, you know, and, and you have those days where you're like, I can't believe they pay me to do this. Um, uh, and then, you know, there's other days where it's a job like any other job, um, you know, it's a fun job, but, um, uh, but, you know, there are, there are good days and bad days. Hopefully you have a good attitude about it um, and you can, uh, you know, find uh, a happy place um, and, um, you know, just enjoy the process. Um, uh, some people get, get burnt out um, and, you know, just, you know, it's, they just seem miserable at work. Um, so for me, mummies, um, I didn't realize at the time how much freedom I had. Um, until I went on to the next show, which was like, oh, this is a bigger show, but it was like, it's a bigger show. And so you have less freedom. Um, you know, with mummies, uh, there were a bunch of rules that they gave me at the beginning about the things that I couldn't do. Um, and I went ahead and did them anyway. Um, and I figured like, well, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Um, uh, and uh, in the end of the things that they said I couldn't do were some of the things that they liked the most because I did. Um, uh, so um it was an obscure show that not a lot of people saw but you know it was it was fun making it um and you know it was a lot of a lot of crazy long hours um uh but you know i was still just a baby uh, so i had no problem working at the studio until you know um two three four in the morning sometimes all night um you know <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, I guess I am the next in line. Um, I have a question both uh, about the production of the show and what's soon to come after. Um, first of all, uh, I want to ask, I know that you were one of the designers in the series. I know that uh, you really liked the mod character in the show because uh, you primarily designed on your own. You had a lot of uh, your personal touch into this character. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you could answer it because it's been like 20 years since the show aired, but um, do you remember any input you had on some specific characters or character designs uh, that was solely your ideas, apart from a uh, character Amat, which uh, again, I know that you hold a very personal level. Yeah, Amat, I, I designed on my own. That was the only one that I, I designed on my own. Um, and um that was the only one that only one person designed um you know we had a um a really talented uh, art director named uh, Stephen Choi um and um you know he he would do uh, all of the design work and then we would go over um the characters and you know come up with different ideas for like what we could do and so you know, it really was a collaboration um you know he did the the final line work um but then you know we had uh you know he had my input i had the executive producer's input and the studio's input and uh, you know um ivan reitman's company's input and the toy company's input um and you know what you get in the end is um what we have um uh so you know steven physically did um the drawings um and you know we had uh colorists that picked the colors and you know and it was all of us looking at everything and um, making making decisions, um, but it really was um, a collaboration um, with a bunch of different people. Uh, so um, that's what happens when you have three big companies that come together to make a show. There are a lot of cooks in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I understand. And uh, a kind of a side note, a question, uh, if you may. Um, because of all the art in the series and uh, because of all the people who work on it, uh, do you owe any specific uh, piece of art from the original series, like uh, maybe some production image? Some I know that you've shown original designs or planned designs uh, on several websites like DeviantArt and Instagram, but uh, is it something that hasn't seen the light of day yet, like, I don't know, like a production image as I said before? Or even some character renders used for product for uh, promotional material. Uh, <clears throat> I think that I have um, I have a box that they used for promotions that um, you know has uh, um, it's kind of like the face that you have for the chat, um, but like they did it in a, a box form that you know would have held 
the the Bible for the show and and stuff like that. Um, and then I have uh, that that water character that I was mentioning. I have some uh, some cells um, of that guy as we were trying to figure out like how how are we going to do water like um, and make it seem seem real. Um, and then I think I have um, like a mummy's. Um, like uh, they had they had paper made so that when they printed out the the Bible they could print it on this paper and it had um, like um, this very like graphic mummy face um, underneath it was almost like a you know a horror um, mummy um, and uh, I think I have one um, cell um, of Jacal that was like. Um, you know, when we were trying to figure out the colors for him, you know, because this the show was um, before TV was being painted digitally. So, you know, it was paint on cells shot on film. Um, uh, and um, so there they actually had at the studio in Burbank, they had in the development department, someone who would paint cells so that you could actually pick which paints you were going to use, um, uh, you know, from the cartoon color library of paint. Um, so uh, that's probably, uh, um, you know, I think maybe I have like, um, you know, a, a little swag thing that they handed out at, um, you know, MIPCOM or something like that. That was like, um, before they even had real art for the show. And it's just like a pyramid in a pyramid shaped snow globe. Um, so instead of a globe, it's a pyramid. Um, and it had like gold um, sand, and you sort of shake it up, and it says "mummies, mummies" on it, or "mummies alive" on it. Um, but yeah, that's about it. Mm. Is there a chance of us uh, ever seeing all that artwork? No, not necessarily now. I don't want to put you in a hassle, but uh, maybe in the future. Uh, I think it would be a really cool piece of a mum's life history to share with the people, especially the fans. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll throw it up on my Instagram. How about that? That sounds awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, sure. Moving on to WDK, uh, um, is there a question you want to ask? I know that you have one question in the questions for Seth the channel. Uh, do you want to stand by that question or do you want to ask a new one? It was uh, kind of answered through the other questions because, um, yeah, but did you have anything uh, when you were starting? Uh, did did you just have anything planned for the long run, for Mummies Alive? Um, I mean, I I really like if if I would have completely had my own way on the show, um, I would have loved to do um, you know, a series long storyline, um, uh, and then if the show were to have continued, um, you know, the the ideas that I was having for a second season. Um, was that it would be like the next year. Um, and so um, Presley would go from being 12 to being 13, which then makes him, you know, uh, an adult for, you know, in ancient Egyptian time. And then he would become, instead of prince, he would become pharaoh. Um, and uh, I thought, like, it'd be cool if he got armor um, and had a transformation sequence of his own and, uh, and stuff like that. Um, um, but yeah, uh, it, you know, if it were to continue, like that's, that's really what I would have wanted to do to like keep doing, uh, season arcs on, on the show, but <clears throat> which is like not a big deal now. Like it's like every series has a, um, you know, a season arc and a series arc and, and all of that. But at the time, uh, you know, there were Japanese shows that were doing that, um, but the only American show that had actually done that was Gargoyles. Um, and it was being used as the reason why you never do that. Um, uh, because, um, you know, some episodes are harder to produce than others. Um, and some episodes have a rougher time going through the production pipeline. Um, and if you have a show that has already scheduled air dates, um, and you have, uh, and all of the episodes have to be aired in, um, you know, a specific order. You can derail your entire production um, if you have, like, <clears throat> sorry, if episode five 
you know, suddenly um, there was just, you know, too many designs for the design department or something. Um, and then it just backs up the entire production. Uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's what I would have done is um, uh. sequential storylines, um, adding more, um, <clears throat> Adding more cultures in, you know, Chinese mummies would have been awesome. Uh, Aztec mummies would have been awesome. Um, ah, Aztec. So you would have, you would have delved into sort of uh, Mexican mythology, Aztec mythology in a bit. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Because you know that um, with the pyramids that they have down there, it was just like any place that had pyramids. Or mummified, um, you know, mummification as a part of their rituals. I'm like, we should try to do something with that. Um, and um, I had also just been to um, uh, uh, Chichen Itza and um, uh, a bunch of um, places down in Mexico, um, and seen all of the the Aztec art, um, and thought like, oh, it'd be so cool to have to incorporate all of that into some you know, battle armor for like Aztec mummies and just have like that, um, that the museum just has these different exhibit exhibits that come through. Um, and, um, and then the same thing happens with those exhibits uh, or, or stuff like that. And so, you know, maybe there would have been, um, you know, for the Aztec mummies or for the Chinese mummies that, um, you know, they had their own set of bad guys, um, you know, just to expand the world a little bit. That sounds so yeah. awesome. If I may ask one like ten little questions, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not my turn. But before we start off, um, since you are going to introduce more cultures into the Mom's Alive universe, uh, this is arguably like a more personal question since I am of Greek origin. Uh, mm. I know that you introduced Talos, which is a Greek creation mm. in the Mom's Alive universe. Would there be in a case where? more greek mythology was at some point planned for the series or would have been for a season two yeah i mean i think it's the same the same thing sort of expanding from you know just uh, egyptian mythology um and uh <clears throat> it's funny like when you bring bring him up <clears throat> sorry I've, it's fine don't, don't worry about it. maybe we shouldn't have done this <laughs> first thing in the morning Got morning throat. Um, if you like, we could take a break if you want to. Uh, no, 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 I'm fine. I, I, I have a drink of water. Um, um, but like you, you bring him up, and I completely forgot about him until you brought him up. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, we had that guy. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, definitely um, expanding to different cultures. I mean, part of the reason why we only had as many characters as we had, and part of why you know, um, I saw there was a chat question about why was um, only one person speaking in this episode. But um, a lot of those things are determined by, um, you know, budget and schedule. Um, and, uh, you know, when a show is being budgeted, um, there are assumptions that are made about the show um, that like, you know, a certain number of new background designs, certain number of new prop designs, certain number of new character designs. Um, and uh, you know, so we would end up re reusing characters um, because of that. Um, but, you know, I would have liked to explore e Egyptian mythology a little bit more also. And, um, you know, like it would have been awesome to have like, it's like a whole new bad guy every episode. Um, but, you know, uh, a lot of that is um, less a creative choice and more of a uh, budgetary constraint. Mm -hmm. I see. I understand. Yeah. Uh, I must say, uh, although I will admit the original lineup of villains in the original series wasn't the biggest out there, it was mm -hmm. definitely diverse enough and interesting enough for, for viewers to keep watching. Um, yeah. Also, uh, Domo joined in. Uh, is there a question Domo would like to ask, Seth? Um, but, I'll figure it out in a bit. Hmm, all right, that's fine. Uh, is anyone else here want to ask like a second round of questions before moving on to the questions for Ch for Seth channel? Um, just pick out if uh, there is another question you guys want to ask before we move on to that channel. And there. 
All right. Yeah, I might uh, have another question, but oh wait, hold, hold on a minute. Uh... All right. Uh, looks like. Would you, like... Would you like to ask the question, or should we move on? No, no. Um, I might get another later, uh, but right now I don't have I don't have anything to ask. All right, that's fine. Um, so uh, let's go over to the questions for Seth Sounds, shall we? Um, we start with Dark Psych, who asks a three round question right off the bat. Um, would there have been another major antagonist to rival Scarab? Yeah, I mean, I could I could go through all of these. Um, uh, you know, if if we were to have incorporated like the Chinese mummies and the Aztec mummies, like there definitely would have been. Um, a scarab-like figure uh, in there, um, and uh, you know, uh, even if we weren't, uh, you know, it would always be nice to have, like, you know, maybe scarab bring someone back from ancient Egypt um, or from the mythology that um, is too much for him to handle, um, and then becomes like over scarab um, in the uh, in the you know bad guy hierarchy. Um, and then uh, the vehicles, uh, how are the vehicles readily available for the mummies to use? Um, I'm not sure what that question is asking. Like, um, I assume it, he's talking about like the, a logic how question. Come, I'm assuming Kia is asking how come the mummies were able to essentially create the vehicles with no proper knowledge of uh, right. modern mechanics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, uh, just... The, the purely honest version of that question is because the toy company wanted to sell vehicles. <laughs> yeah. But, um, the, trying to like apply like a story based logic to it. Um, you know, the idea was that, um, uh, you know, that the ancient Egyptians were more advanced than we give them credit for. Um, and also kind of drawing from, uh, you know, what we had seen in Stargate, um, you know, like, oh my God, like maybe they're not even from this planet. Um, uh, that um, that maybe that there had been technology that had been lost over time, um, and so I feel like in some of the episodes um, we went a little deeper into how the their things actually worked, and it wasn't like you know internal combustion engine or something, but some sort of like you know ancient lost tech um, that was uh, was used, but but really you know it's. Yeah, the answer is they toy companies. Sell toys. Yeah, because <laughs> you know, um, I uh, you know the the fact that um, you know the hot raw um, was um, you know the toy is a, is seats one, um, but they wanted it to seat um, uh, the whole team, um, and so all of a sudden you've got this funny car, um, like you know, drag racing funny car. Um, that seats uh, five um, or six sometimes. Um, so it's like a minivan at the back, but then it has a long drag racing front end. And somehow this car is navigating the streets of San Francisco. Um, you know, I completely annoyed we made... them. Uh, What's that? Oh, I said I'm completely unnoticed throughout the most right. of the series. Yeah. yeah. For them. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine that that car driving around anywhere going unnoticed? Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I, I think that we made, um, we poked fun at it a little bit um, with, you know, how bumpy the ride would be, like going down those streets and, and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, I have to say that my, my, one of my biggest regrets with mummies was that I didn't do a trip to San Francisco and you know take a bunch of pictures and you know really base things off of like actual streets in San Francisco or or anything like that. You know, if we were doing it today, um, you know, I'd be using um, you know Street View to um, you know place it in different places. But um, so you know, when I've watched the episodes, you know, because my my daughters are old enough now that they're interested in um, in that. Um, and when I watch it now, I'm like, oh, my God, that doesn't look anything like San Francisco. What were we doing? <laughs> yeah. So and then uh, the other question about transformation sequence. Um, 
uh, definitely would have had, um, you know, Presley uh, transformation sequence um, when, when in the next season when he became Pharaoh. But um, the transformation sequences, um, you know, I, I, um, is the p part of the animation that I'm like, man, that just like it just crushed. That was so cool. Um, uh, and you know, uh, growing up, I was such a big fan of like Thundercats and Silverhawks, and um, you know, uh, you know, even like He Man and um, those those shows. Um, that uh, I was like that transformation sequence has to be the most kick-ass thing in the show um and uh so the the guy that actually animated it um you know japanese animator um you know, had been working on eon flux um just before working on mummies um and uh he really just like knocked it out of the park it was so cool and the, the transformation thing is i must say is uh what brought a lot of people into the series and definitely one of the most memorable parts uh and of course one of the best looking parts of the series as well yeah um, it's it also more on, a, on a production um side note um it also was uh was thrown in whenever we needed um like uh all right this episode's a little short how many transformation sequences do we have in here okay let's <laughs> throw another one in um, you know, we, we had a problem with um, uh, scripts coming up short frequently, um, and um, we, we weren't able to um, uh, just add new dialogue, um, you know, so uh, the only place that I could add was like, you know, maybe we could get like a, another like couple of seconds on establishing shots or something. Um, or maybe we add we throw in a transformation sequence and that gets us up to our shift length. Um, uh, or or it gets us to our air length if we were you know really that short um, and um, you know there were uh, the only other way that I could add time was to add to the fight scenes um, uh, so if you see an episode that has like a lot of fight scenes um, that's the reason <laughs> because that episode <laughs> came up really short uh, and there's one episode that I was like I mean this is so short like I can't add um, you know uh three minutes of fight scene to like um get this episode to length um and uh so i added this like way overly dramatic um dialogue scene where um you you don't actually see jacal's mouth ever moving um and he's just talking about before they go into this fight that like this could be it um and it just like this huge long um, speech about um, how it's been an honor serving with you and like all of the stuff. Um, and uh, the animation was just like the characters in these like hero poses with like, you know, um, you know, hair flowing in the wind or stuff like that and like little pans and stuff. And um, I mean, it was kind of, it was a cool moment, but it was also a production moment where it was like, we need to add a lot of time. So, we're just going to add a long speech in here, um, long dramatic speech. Mm -hmm, I understand. And uh, I think if it's not completely out of place, and uh, if it also serves a whole general thing to the plot, like if just, you know, um, it, it, it works just fine. I understand that it can be hard sometimes to uh, complete a full script, 22 minute script, uh, especially on for 42 episodes. Yeah, well, and um, so, you know, a lot of our writers were were freelance, um, and so sometimes they're coming into the show for just one script, um, and um, the studio had decided that um, the script length was going to be thirty five pages, um, and so um, sometimes the writers would um, would write scripts that were longer than 35 pages and then we would have to like trim it down to 35 pages and those were were the episodes where we didn't have a a, a hard time with the overall length of the episode but there were some scripts where you could tell that the writer was like really adding in a bunch of extra um uh description into the action um section uh, to get it to 35 pages like they were really stretching to get it to 35 pages and and those were the scripts that 
when it was actually boarded and timed out, um, you know, they, they fell short um, because they just added a bunch of extra, you know, adverbs and adjectives to uh, get to length. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, so, of, so move on to the next question. Uh, I think we've answered the WD case question. Uh, Agent uh, G245 asks uh, another correlated question. Uh, did Wrath reverse engineer human tech to make the vehicles? Uh, there's probably a little bit of that and then probably a little bit of uh, uh, ancient Egyptian high tech, low tech, high tech. Hmm. Um, honestly, well, I think it was implied at some point in the series, although I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, next question is, uh, will there have been an episode or two exploring the mommy's family of friends uh, we saw in Eye of the Beholder? Uh, yeah. Um... And I, I, we always tried to like, you know, call back to Jakal's family. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I feel like that in every episode we, we touched a little bit on, uh, or not in every episode, but for every one of the mummies, we touched a little bit on what their life had been like before. Um, uh, oh, um, it, it reminds me of um, another thing that I would have done in, the second season is, um, you know, once Presley becomes um, Pharaoh, and then for Jakal, um, it's kind of like his job is done a little bit um, because he was guiding the young prince. Um, and uh, so I thought it might be cool to have like something develop between Jakal and Presley's mom um, and have Jakal kind of becoming a bit of a father figure. Um, and, uh, sorry, just that question reminded me of that. No, no, it's fine. Uh, it's a side note question here. Um, I'm not How much gonna did it lie. Cost? Uh, okay. I'm not gonna lie. Uh, this kind of whole I thought a uh, series of uh, Jack Hall and um, Amanda Presley's mom getting together does sound a little bit weird because we have to address the elephant in the room that Jacal is dead. Um, right. But, um, yeah. I mean, it would be weird, <laughs> you know, but it was, it was a, a comedy also. <laughs> so, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of jokes that could come out of that. Uh, uh, um, um, I mean, I, I keep thinking of that, but then I keep uh, thinking of the, the other episode where Nefertina gets a, a modern day love interest. And I'm thinking like yeah, yeah. maybe would have worked something like that. It was never really portrayed that weirdly in the series. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, uh, we kind of did. Been a, I think it could have been a Beauty and the Beast kind of a situation where it's like you know uh, they're in love, but you know it, it can only ever go so far, uh, kind of a thing. Torture yeah, romance. Yeah. Uh, a little bit of trads in this comedy, I guess, yeah. as a whole. Um, I think we did already kind of answer this question. How much did it cost to animate it all? I don't know if he's expecting an, an actual number, but uh, or more, I'm, I'm assuming more of an estimation in general. I think it was about um, uh, 200,000 uh, an episode. So, 200,000. If you want to do the math, um, which at the time, I think that um, uh, I want to say that the Batman... Uh, animated series or like other series at Disney, that their budgets were were um, five hundred thousand and up um, per episode. Um, uh, and then now, you know, um, I don't know, like today, um, but um, when I was doing um, Dilbert uh, and you know, sort of like the the starting number for like a primetime show. Um, it's more like um, a million an episode, million a quarter. Um, uh, but you know, for prime time shows, um, a lot of that is going to the writers and the performers um, because you're, you're paying more for your actors and stuff like that. Um, where with mummies, um, you know, it's all animated in you know Japan and Korea, um, and we did pre-production in Burbank um, and post in Burbank. Um, uh, and then the voices were all recorded in Vancouver um, because it's cheaper to record 
in, in Vancouver. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, now I think we did answer the first question. Um, Harris asks a couple of questions. Um, number one, did Ivan Reitman have any say in this show? Um, you know, I actually met Ivan, um, and um, uh, it was mostly his um, producers at Northern Lights that were involved. Um, so it was Dan Goldberg and Joe Medchuk. Um, and, and I think really Joe Medchuk was the one that was the most involved. Um, I, you know, maybe Dan was more involved um, earlier on, um, but those, those were the, the guys that, that were mostly doing the stuff. But um, I got to go over to uh, Northern Lights when they were on the Universal uh, lot, um, and they had this, like, crazy, like, fancy building that was, like, you know, uh, this super modern, like, you know, it was just so cool. Um, and I remember the first time that I went over there, um, uh, I have, and I still have this car. It's a 73 um, Datsun. Um, and um, in, you know, 96 or whatever, when, um, you know, we were doing the show, um, it had definitely seen better days. Um, and uh, it's in better shape now than it was then. But I remember pulling into their underground parking and it was like, um, Jag, Mercedes, BMW, Bentley, Rolls, like, you know, every car that you can think of, like the most expensive <laughs> cars. And then I'm rolling in with, in my Z um, with like, you know, a uh, special exhaust that makes it sound even beefier. Um, and I probably set off every single car alarm as I went in there. Um, and I was just like, oh my God, uh, at least it wasn't, at least it didn't backfire or burn oil. Um, uh, but, um, uh, and I got to meet Ivan, um, I think just once, um, and, you know, originally the designs of the characters, there was more variation, um, in, in the body types, um, like Nefertina was definitely more petite, um, and Armand was more of like a, like just a brick wall and he was just mm -hmm. like, you know, a giant square. And yeah. then Jacal was more of the like traditional superhero body uh and then wrath was really long and lean like even more so than he is now um and um uh, ivan had just um done uh space jam um and there was a big issue in space jam with the height difference between the characters um uh and so you know he, he had a note that um you know we shouldn't have so much height height difference between the characters I, and I think that that may have been the only note that I got from him. Um, and then the rest was uh, from Joe Medchek and Dan Goldberg. But I mean, they're, they're speaking for him. So, um, you know, it could be that he saw everything um, and then they were just the ones um, getting the notes back. Hmm. In terms of uh, the, the size of the characters in the series, I really did remember Armand being like the larger of the mom. He said a little brick wall. But looking back, uh, he did. He was kind of the same, a little bit, maybe a little bit higher in terms of uh, yeah. height than other models. Yeah, but not at the way I remember him. I don't know if there was an inconsistency or um, <coughs> the way the show was actually designed. Um, no, he definitely was. He was definitely going to be like you know much much bigger, um, like um, like Hulk big. Oh. I guess he really does enjoy eating his burgers in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, maybe, maybe if um if the show was to be rebooted and, and go again, <clears throat> um, maybe we would do it that way and have Nefertina be, you know, um, a little on the more petite side, um, and uh, you know, still like super athletic and everything, but um, just between Nefertina and Armand having um that you know, big of a size difference. Like she was like half as tall as he was. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, everyone else was sort of in between. But yeah. yeah, but then, you know, you could, you then maybe the, the hot raw would only fit Armand. Uh, <laughs> maybe we would see on top of the car. 
Yeah, we also wouldn't have all those vehicles. I thought that the motorcycle was really cool, um, but you know, it was like, why? But why? Um, like, you know, Jakal <laughs> flying was like the the thing that made the most sense. Um, and so it was like, if he can fly, why wouldn't they all just fly? And if they have this magic to come back to life, like, why why wouldn't they just have magic that they can like fly around? Like, why couldn't um, Wrath just make him like you know ancient Egyptian flying wings or something? I don't know. I guess a flying rat figure wouldn't sell us much as a literal car, as you said. Yeah, you but yeah, the, it's <laughs> the action figures and then the vehicles. You know, you got to get the whole set. <laughs> yeah. Um, next question is uh, obviously this is primarily a mommy's alive interview, but uh, since we do have you here, we do need to ask: uh, What other projects do you work on? What's your most proud work? You know. Uh, you know, I started out on a show called The Max. Um, it was on MTV. Um, uh, I went from The Max to The Simpsons. I did a season there. And then I went from The Simpsons to um, uh, to Disney um, and did um, Timon and Pumbaa. Uh, and then Mummies comes um, right after that. Um, and then after Mummies, um, I... Um, did uh dilbert um after dilbert i did eight crazy nights um and um after eight crazy nights i did the uh the kingdom hearts pilot then i worked on family guy then i did a show called slacker cats and then there's been a bunch of other pilots that didn't go that no one would even know about um I've worked on Phineas and Ferb, Scooby Doo, uh, Looney Tunes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, just recently I was at, at uh, DreamWorks, um, and uh, now I'm doing a show um, for uh, Netflix um, called Brown and Friends. It's based on uh, the Line Friends characters um, from Korea. That's my whole mm -hmm. career in a bunch of, you know, leaving out a bunch of um, development projects and smaller um, things that I didn't have as, as much involvement in. Um, but yeah. Um, I want to add something. Uh, I have seen um, a bunch of advertisements for this, and uh, your profile picture is kind of based on this. Are you working on your own movie right now? Um, Will and Neil? I have seen that poster, I think, in your website yeah. or uh, your company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's something that um, I've been developing for a long time. Um, and, um, you know, we got really close for um, a Netflix series um, for that. Um, and mm -hmm. we have a feature script. Um, and there's been some interest um, uh, for uh, a feature film, but um, you know it's all still you know, in development. You know it's really hard to get original stuff made. Uh, so um, someday, mm -hmm. it's a thing. You know, that's kind of the passion project. It looks like you're on the right path. Obviously, you know what you're doing. <laughs> for you to make yeah. your own uh, animated uh, movie, but yeah, it it's just you know the the hard part about um, feature animation is that, um, you know, when they think of an animated feature, they think of something that costs like, you know, 60 to 100 million dollars. And so then that's the, the mentality that it's got to cost 60 to 100 million. And then I think like, well, how about something that costs like six to 10? Um, uh, but, um, you know, the all of the business models are based on that bigger um, movie. Um, and uh, so, you know, there's not a lot of evidence of, you know, smaller movies, um, you know, even making their money back. Um, you know, you could spend uh, a million making it um, and not even make money back. Yeah, someone's chiming in. Yeah. So basically, they all think that, uh, that if it's like feature, then it's going to be like all of all like super expensive and state of the art and everything, right? Yeah, that's that's the idea of uh, like when they think of a of a theatrical animated movie. Yeah, it's um, you know, can it uh, you know, is it a four quadrant movie? Is it a tentpole movie? Um, uh, you know, and, and you know, this is the studios here, but you know, the same thing happens in live action with um, you know, um, all of the Marvel movies and. 
you know, suddenly, um, uh, you know, studios are, are only spending, you know, a hundred, two hundred million dollars on movies. And then the smaller movies are, are, you know, don't, you know, they have a harder time finding funding because, um, you know, so much of the studio is banking on those really big budget blockbusters. Um, so, you know, I, I, my hope for animation in the future um, is that um, you know we can have some lower budgeted movies that come out and do really well and find an audience um, and that we can have a little bit more um, diversity in terms of the kinds of movies that are made um, for uh, you know a feature audience um, you know I, I think in Japan there's a much wider range of um, projects that get made um, but uh, here um, you know it's it's less so. I, I'd I'd love to see um you know a psychological thriller that's an animated feature you know um a, a, an animated horror film or you know an animated western or an animated you know detective story or you know um, something like that like uh, um, I think anything could be done. When you said like animated thriller film, I immediately remember this movie called Cool World. I don't know if you know about it. Uh -huh. Yep. Yeah. I saw Cool World in the theater. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I don't really think of it as that as a thriller. Like when I think thriller, I think of a movie like Perfect Blue. Um, no, I said um, uh, I meant Cool World because um, the original script for that movie was supposed to be like a lot darker, and uh, it was actually oh, very yeah, interesting. Yeah. But it it ah. got like changed and ah. stuff, and so yeah, yeah, it yeah. almost became it almost became that. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's been different a... moments. Oh, I think that's Ralph Bakshi um, uh, being Ra yeah, Ralph. Yeah, it was Bakshi, Ralph Bakshi. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there there have been moments. Um, where, you know, there, there was a, a glimmer of hope, um, that like on TV, that there could be something other than a comedy in prime time. Um, you know, there was a, um, a Spielberg, um, animated show, um, uh, I, f I forget the name, but it was like an alien invasion show. Um, and, um, it just looked, um, it looked like a Saturday morning show. And so the, you know, the audience just didn't show up for it. And then, and then that's used as the example of, well, if Steven Spielberg can't make it work, then no one can make it work. Um, you know, or um, when uh, I think that this is different now, but you know, when Titan AE first came out, you know, it was like, Ooh, there's going to be sci-fi now in, um, in animation because you know, it was Titan AE and then Treasure Planet, and then neither of those movies really did well at the box office. And so it was like, okay, so this is why you can't do sci-fi in animation. Um, but, um, you know, I think that you could do anything. Uh, it really is a bit of a shame, because I really did enjoy Titan, Titan AE. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, it, would be, it would be nice to do some different things. Uh, uh, go ahead. Um, how difficult was your show in the rating? Did you shows like Extreme Ghostbusters, Men in Black, Recess, Spinning in the Brain, Casper, and a whole lot of the, uh, and a whole lot of other table shows, uh, Stealing Mom's Life Thunder. If I have to say something before you you start, please, um, Mr. Kisley, um, I would personally like to add a little side note to the question. Um, how how, how did you perceive? All the ratings, both, um, I assume, uh, positive and negative, uh, at that young age when you did start working on the series. How was it for you, personally? Um, well, I mean, by the time the show aired, we were, um, you know, at, at least half, maybe three quarters of the way through um, the, the production. Um, and uh, Extreme Ghostbusters and Men in Black um, weren't on at the same time. Uh, and um, I think Pinky and the Brain was on, um, but, uh, um, you know, all of those shows were um, on in, uh, you know, on like WB or on like the Disney, you know, Disney owned um, some TV stations before now, now they own ABC. 
Um, and, uh, you know, as far as the ratings went, um, you know, Mummies was airing Monday through Thursday at like seven in the morning. Um, and, you know, so we're like, that's a horrible time slot. Um, you know, kids are getting ready for school. They're not like sitting down to watch cartoons. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, <clears throat> you know, it, it would have done better if it was on in the afternoon. It would have been done. It would have done better if it was on like Monday through Friday. But, you know, there was some other show that was airing in that slot on Fridays. And that's why it's only 42 episodes instead of 65, which is the usual or at the time it was the usual syndication number. Um, so for mummies, um, you know, I, it was just I was just happy to have done a show and that it was on the air, you know, um, and. And, uh, you know, I saw, um, I, I would search um, the internet, you know, back in the day um, uh, and, you know, see if anyone was talking about the show because it kind of felt like it just sort of like went out there and then, you know, you don't hear about it. And, you know, definitely no one knew about it, um, you know, that was working in animation. If you didn't work on the show, you didn't know about it because, you know, it was um, on at seven in the morning, <laughs> Monday yeah. through Thursday. Um, and, uh, so there were, there were some early fan sites that, you know, I really like tried to, you know, stoke whatever fan fire there was. Um, and so I would reach out to the fan sites and, um, talk to them about the show and, uh, stuff like that. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, it was less about ratings for me with that one. Um, you know, when it moves on to, uh, Dilbert. Uh, then it was a little bit more about ratings, um, and then it gets into this really frustrating place where um, you know you you have no control over how much marketing is done for the thing that you're working on, and so you put all of this time and energy into it. And um, and you know, like with with mummies, you just never saw any commercials ever anywhere for the show or for the toys. Um, you know, and so it was just like, well, why did we why did we spend all the time making the thing if you're not going to promote it? Um, and um, with Dilbert, they they did like a huge push for the first episode, and the first episode, um, you know, it was on UPN, um, which you know used to be a network. Maybe you guys don't even know. Um, uh, and um, uh, they did a huge per push for the first episode, uh, and then after that, um, nothing. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the ratings just gradually went down. Like you know, it was like a stepping, you know, gradual descent um, in the ratings because they weren't promoting it at all. Um, so it got yeah. their their biggest rating for a non Star Trek show um, or biggest rating for a comedy on their network. And then they just thought that, like, well, it's, it's, we don't have to. The people show up for the show. Um, but, you know, if you don't advertise, people don't show up. Uh, fortunately enough, the series did find an eventual audience uh, even bigger than uh, with um, the VHS sales and the DVD sales. Uh, yeah. I know me and I know that many other fans were actually introduced via the DVD sales. So I guess that's good, at least. Um, but, yeah. Uh, let's see, we move on to the final question from Hammers. Uh, do you think that the show would have been more successful with better writing and much more talented voice cast, like how Sonic Saturday, um, starting I guess AM, uh, had more American voice actors than like most of the cartoon? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> you know, I mean, the yeah, budget, <clears throat> you know, higher yeah. budget, um, you know, you can hire better writers you can hire better voice actors um uh so yeah all of those things can make it better um but you know mm -hmm. if um if marketing doesn't market it then you know you can have the best show ever that no one watches which you know there, um i think we can all think of a show like that that was like oh my god that show is so good how come they didn't make any more uh, so yeah we all have that one so you know, I, I tend to forget that the Sonic cartoons were also made by Deke. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of the actual um, cartoons might have were made by Deke, and I didn't even uh, realize it as a kid. But, uh, yeah. There was a but, you know, Sonic, part of our Sonic talk. is a, you know, a, an established um, brand. So, you know, um, there's already um, 
uh, audience awareness for Sonic, um, you know, before a cartoon comes out, you know, or uh, the, you know, Mario Brothers cartoon or, you know, um, uh, you know, most of the other cartoons that, that they did, you know, already had brand awareness. Um, and, you know, Mummies was, you know, coming out of nowhere. Um, so. there's, hmm. there's also one thing I wanted to say, since you also um, um, worked for Deke, I, want, I just want to say real quick, I, uh, it's surprising how many Deek shows I watched as a kid without really knowing because um, yeah. here in Latin, in Latin America, they, they showed a lot of uh, Deek shows um, yeah. back in the day. I, I don't know um, if like the studio was aware that we, you were kind of big in like, you know, in um, South American stuff, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I only did mummies for Deek, um, uh, but, um, you know, for me growing up, uh, I remember uh, so many shows that Deke was doing, um, like, uh, especially in the 80s, I think, um, you know, it was like every network had a Deke show, um, and uh, they, they were just, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that was their first one and their and their biggest one. Um, but, um, you know, Inspector Gadget, uh, Dennis the Menace, uh, Heathcliff, um, uh, you know, crazy shows like, you know, Hulk Hogan's Action Heroes or, you know, something like that. Um, uh, they, I, they did the New Kids on the Block show. I think that they did the MC Hammer show, you know. Um, uh, the guy who ran Deke was, um, you know, the, the one thing he, like, superpower that he had was... <clears throat> Getting shows sold, um, so <clears throat> so yeah, it was um, there was a lot of Deke shows, um, and uh, you know it, they they weren't always known for having the best quality. Um, you know, um, uh, there's um, the the DIC. Um, a lot of people um, you know called it uh, said that it stands for do it cheap. Um, uh, but um, you know, I, I think it was about like selling as many shows as you could, um, uh, and um, you know, that for for um, an independent studio like that to to become as big as they were, you you kind of got to give them some credit for that. So so they were kind of like the um, the Hanna Barbera of like the well the second Hanna Barbera of the 80s kind of 90s, yeah in a way yeah yeah. <laughs> I mean, Hanna Barbera, you know, found themselves in a, in a um, almost monopoly position over uh, TV animation, and you know, at their at their height um, uh, of income, it was probably also at their lowest point in terms of quality. Um, you know, they yeah. they probably supplied ABC, NBC, and CBS with most of their Saturday morning. Um, and probably most of their uh, afternoons, um, uh, but um, oh. but that's uh, that's also where um, you know exporting the production to uh, you know Japan and, and uh, you know Korea starts. Hmm. I was going to say. Budget. I was going to say real quick that Dick was like the next Hanna Barbera, but then I'm like, oh no, wait, Hanna Barbera still existed back then. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, um, but it, it's a fair point that uh, yeah, Deke was like the next Hanna Barbera. Um, mm. But you know, Hanna Barbera, um, you know, you think about like the all of the huge successes that they had that were all internally um, created, um, where um, Deke was more taking established brands and um, selling shows off of established brands, so. Um, you know, the thing that Deke didn't have that Hanna Barbera did have was um, a library of shows that they owned. Um, you know, so uh, Hanna Barbera could continue to make money off of reruns, um, and uh, Hanna Barbera um, was bought by Turner um, specifically for their library, um, uh, so that um, you know Cartoon Network could be created with the Hanna Barbera library. Mm. <clears throat> Uh, I want to tie something into this as well. Uh, that you 
for uh, pretty much I'm sure that I already know the answer to this, but uh, were you aware of the distribution of uh, Moments of Life to other countries at all? Like, uh, I'm pretty sure you knew that it was going to be promoted to other countries as well, but uh, did you have any part in it or? No, I was, uh, you know, as soon as I finished my last day, um, that was the end of my contact with um, Mommy's Alive, you know. I was mm -hmm. hired to make the show, and once the show was done, I mean, I guess if I had stayed at Deke, you know, possibly I would have been um, more involved, but, um, but you know, but probably not. Like, you know, if I had stayed at Deke, I would have just been on to the next show. Um, and it's a completely different department that handles all of the sales and um, marketing and licensing and uh, all of that stuff. Hmm. Well, uh, I actually like so you saw. Um, I I am not sure <laughs> exactly how to pretty much do this, but I'm pretty sure you're gonna get a kick out of it. Um, the cover of how the show was going to be promoted here in Greece. Um, would you like to take a look at it? Uh, because it's uh, quite bizarre if I do yeah, so sure. myself. How do I see it? Um, I'll, po I'll post it in a VC chat. Uh, the, the, okay. That's the channeling. <laughs> this is the cover of it. And uh, the funniest part is the actual back of the VHS tape. Um, nothing, nothing came through. <laughs> this is um oh wait okay i see <laughs> this is definitely something in my opinion uh, just a just wait. a little weird piece of art oh wow is, is yeah. that the yeah. actual art that you saw on the on, on like the thing that's the actual art they used to promote this so here on a wow. vhs so. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> been, Scarab is especially jarring to me, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, uh, that is some quality uh, art right there. Uh, yeah. Reminds me I mean, of those. Jacal looks like Jacal, <laughs> and that's where it ends. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so we move on to the next question. I, I think I'm gonna skip Dark Strikes' uh, question now for. Dramatic effect. Keep it to the end, um, and move on to uh, Bahamut's um, questions. The first one being, uh, what would it take? What would it have taken to secure another twenty-three episodes? I suspect you know why I selected that number. Um, that's basically the question. I don't know if you, you know why. I mean, you I'm guessing that, number, that but... the twenty-three episodes brings it up to sixty-five, which was um, you know like standard syndication um, number. Um, mm -hmm. But um, uh, and, and usually, um, what would happen with the show is that you know you'd have like you know thirteen episodes, like you'd have a, like a thirteen or twenty-six episode order, and that's like an order for like one or two seasons. Um, of Saturday mornings, you know, for um, you know, two two years worth of uh, worth of cartoons. Um, uh, in prime time, it's twenty six um, uh, is like the standard single season order. Um, and so, what used to happen was um, you'd have um, you know a show would get thirteen episodes, and then they might get another thirteen episodes, and then gradually you'd build to that. Um, 65 episodes number, um, and um, and then you could go into syndication, which would mean that your show goes from being on just on Saturday morning to being on you know weekday mornings or weekday afternoons um, uh, because there's enough episode, episodes. Um, but with Mummies, um, they went straight to syndication um, because uh, Hasbro has had then um you know their own syndication arm um and so um so they went straight to syndication and i think they had another show um that they were showing on the fridays so um you know mummies was um uh sold for monday through thursday mm -hmm. um and um uh and then uh they had another show that was on friday and so that's why I went straight to syndication. Yeah, 
Uh, and what would it take for more episodes? Um, you know, uh, I think it would take, um, you know, the whoever the new owner is of the license um, for them to want to do, to see enough value in the show to, to um, you know, do a reboot. Mm-hmm. I see. Uh, so, yeah, um, let's move on to the final question. Uh, yeah, what would it take to, uh, you know, actually, has there ever been any thoughts of reviving the series? Uh, I mean, you know, I, I've thought about it, like, you know, especially, you know, now my, my I have kids now, um, and, the, you know, they're at an age where they would be into it. Um, uh I, I think that it would be like a complete do-over um, and, you know, maybe uh, could change a lot of the things that bothered me about the show um, and, uh, you know, make it a little darker, um, uh, you know. Um, but, um, but I think that, you know, it's, it would be a, a pretty huge stretch for, um uh, you know, the current license owner to um, to want to do more episodes um, because, it, you know, I think that um, I think that it's DHX Media still now that that um, think, um, uh, owns from it. the little research yeah. I've done, I'm pretty sure the company that owns the the rights to Mom's Alive is uh, a Canadian company called Wild Brain because they did post several episodes on YouTube. Mm-hmm. With original art, with the original art of the series and stuff oh. like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, um, I imagine that within the library that they bought, that Mummies was one one of the many shows in the library that they bought, and that you know, within that library, um, you know, the, I'm sure that there are um, other things that you know were are, are more established um, at this point even than Mummies. Hmm. Um, currently seeing uh, Wild Brain is uh, more known and it seems like they're doing more uh, so is primarily focused to little children um, like preschool also, I don't think that the license would really be something that would interest them uh, saying that there would be a possibility of uh, rebooting the franchise uh, I think it's safe to assume that you would jump onto it right um, yeah, I would be, uh, I, you know, it, it's all depends on, um, availability and, you know, stuff like that. Like I don't, I don't own any part of it. So it's not like I would, you know, you know, aside from a salary, um, you know, gain anything from it. Um, except that, you know, it, it is something that, you know, it was my first show. And so, you know, like it, it always holds a, a dear place. Um, uh, and, you know, I, I feel like that, I'm looking at some of the art that you've been posting in the other um, chat. Um, you know, those are like Steven's designs. I would so love to see a show that looks exactly like that, you know, um, uh, that, mm-hmm. that doesn't have the, doesn't fall short um, the way, um, you know, the show fell short in a lot of ways um, just because of the budget. Uh, so, so yeah, I would be into it. But. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I don't think we've got any questions left. If you guys have any questions left, just uh, feel free to uh, go through them to um, so speak out. But uh, it seems like we're done with the questions. Does anyone yeah. else want to ask something? Or... Seems like the, the stream is dead. <laughs> we like we, over, <laughs> we, we um, have. Uh, yeah. It's uh, we, we have I'm even the from my from my wife saying like, "Hey, are you going to be done soon?" Because we've got. Um, company coming over tonight and so she's got a long list of things oh. to do. Oh, I'm so sorry to for you to keep it uh, that long. But um well, it's, we, it's don't worry, we do have the entire <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Uh really does mean a lot for the first of all, it still baffles me that you still interact with this fan base. Like that means so much to us as a whole. Yeah. Um well, and uh it means a lot to me that thank you for all fans for the show and um uh <laughs> You know, and and new f- people that are discovering it for the first time. It's like awesome. Maybe it'll have its have its day someday. 
I, I have personally done my part of trying to bring more people into the series with the server. And I've successfully brought a couple of people that uh, enjoy the series. Uh, I, I want to keep Mommies Alive a living franchise. Right, I thought you were going to say um, Alive. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, but yeah, thanks a lot for answering our questions. Thanks a lot, a lot for being here. And thanks to everyone who participated in this live interview. It really does mean a lot. Um, hopefully, uh, I don't want to put any pressure on you. But, uh, it would be nice if you could uh, come in and say a quick hello here and there. Uh, of course, no pressure if uh, you're busy. I understand. We all understand. But uh, sure. yeah, thank yeah. you so much um, for being here. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Yes, of course. Thank you.